I want to talk to you about the Golan Heights. Golan Heights was in the news this past week because of President Trump's recognition of Israel's sovereignty over the Golan Heights, something that Israel had done itself more than a decade ago. Now, I'm a little bit technologically challenged, by the way, that <laughs> what just happened makes me believe in God. <laughs> okay? So if we look at this map here, okay, if we look at this map, you can see that the Golan Heights are in northern Israel. By the way, I think there's also a red. Is that it? Yeah, I don't know. You want to try to figure that out? There's not that many slides like that. Okay? But you can see the Golan Heights is that white area up there. With Syria, that's a very important idea. Okay? With Syria over to the right hand side. Okay? And on the left, down at the bottom, is the Sea of Galilee with the Jordan River coming out. You see that? That's the Sea of Galilee. And then to the left of the Sea of Galilee, you just keep on going west and you hit Haifa. Okay, now the Golan Heights is a place that uh, uh, basically is mentioned in the Bible. And one of the earliest uh, mentions in, in the Hebrew Bible of the Golan Heights was a, when it was referred to as Bashan, B-A-S-H-A-N. And it's really interesting. In the book, in the Amos, chapter 4, verse 1. You'll look this up when you get back to your church. Okay? In Amos chapter 4, ver verse 1, it says, Hear this word, you, uh, you like this part, okay? Hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who are on the hills of Samaria. Now, that doesn't make any sense because Samaria is to the south of Nazareth and Bashan is in the Golan Heights, okay? And he continues, the prophet Amos said, Hear this word, you cows of Bashan on the hills of Samaria, who say to your husbands, Bring us uh, wine, let's get high, and let's correct. This is already part of the, of the book of Amos, okay? But this is what Amos says. But he calls the women of Samaria the cows of Bashan. And why does he call them the cows of Bashan? Because that is a cow of Bashan. I didn't even believe it. Not in my wildest dreams, Nancy, could I have imagined this. Okay? I Googled cows of Bashan picture, and that's what I got. Okay? What a fat cow. Okay? Now, I don't know that they had Guernseys or whatever these are back then. Those are not Guernseys. They're uh, whatever. They're cows. Okay, but, but they, so the cows of Bashan, these, these really fat cows are up there on the Golan Heights because the height, the Golan is uh, volcanic. It goes up, it rises up, and then it's a big plateau. And there's lots of uh, grasses and grazing for cows. And there's lots of cows up there today and all sorts of cow, cow paths. And it's a great place for people to raise cows. So this is one of the earliest. This one goes back. 20, almost 2,800 years ago, okay? The cows of Bashan is the way that the Golan Heights were, were referred to. Now, if we go to about uh, 1,600 years ago, we get to a place, a Jewish city, that actually was uh, probably started at, at least around 200 CE, but this is a synagogue in the city of Katsrin, which is... The synagogue is from about 400 CE, and it's made out of uh, basalt, the volcanic rock that's there, not this Jerusalem stone rock, because it's in the in the in the uh, uh, Golan Heights, okay? And it's made out of this, and there were Jews living there. In 400 uh, CE, there were Jews that were living there. They had a uh, mosaic. Uh, on the on the floor, we found evidence of a mosaic. But the most amazing thing to me is that this is the door. This is the door to their to their synagogue. And on the door, it says in Hebrew an inscription that says, "This is the Beit Midrash of Rabbi Eliezer, the caper maker." And he's actually mentioned later on in, in the Talmud. But the thing that always struck me the most, okay, going back to when I used to be a tour guide in Israel, the thing that struck me the most is that on the right-hand side of that lintel, okay, of the doorway into the Golan Heights, if you look carefully, you can see the place where they put the mezuzah. 
You can't see it in this picture. You have to leave it. Okay? But you can see that this is where they put a mezuzah on their doorposts. The same the way that we had. Remember I talked you about this earlier tonight? That we have a mezuzah on our doorposts. Okay? Now, let's look at some other pictures of the Golan. This is the Golan Heights looking down. Looking down onto the Sea of Galilee. A beautiful uh, picture. But it also gives you the idea of that if you can control the Golan Heights, you have an enormous strategic advantage. From 1948 to 1967, the Golan Heights was controlled by the Syrians. And the area down below where you see the green, by the, that's actually Kibbutz uh, uh, Angia, uh, that, that area is where Jews were living. That's the area where is, Israelis were living. And you can see what the high ground, the strategic uh, effect of being in the high ground. This is the opposite direction. This is from across the Sea of Galilee, probably in the area of Tiberias, looking across the Sea of Galilee and what the Golan Heights look like from there. Now, it just so happens that the poetess Rachel, a hundred years ago, wrote a poem, Sham Hare Golan. Over there are the hills of the Golan Heights. She wrote a wonderful poem about it. But again, these two pictures show you this one's looking down and this one is looking up. The strategic advantages, the strategic advantages of controlling the Golan Heights and understanding, once again, that from 1948 to 1967, the Golan Heights were under the control of the Syrian government. On June, on the, uh, on uh, June 9th, in 1967, the Syrians, in the midst of something called the Six Day War, and it actually had been a couple of days before, had begun shelling the area below, the area below, and with massive shelling. They had done this periodically ever since 1963 and 1964. There were people that were living down there, Jews who were living down there. They got used to sleeping almost every night in bomb shelters. Children, there's a wonderful genre of literature of children's poems in Hebrew that most of them have been translated, children's poems that were written in those bomb shelters. People, they slept, they, they were ready to go to those bomb shelters at any moment because the Syrians could start from the heights of the Golan, just uh, uh, shelling. On the fifth and sixth day of the Six Day War, after enduring all of this shell shelling, the Israeli uh, army, okay, under the Golani Brigade, responded and took over the Golan Heights and pushed the Syrians uh, back. And, to, and in order to see how much they conquered, you have to go to that white area. So they pushed the Syrians way back on the plateau of the Gol uh, Golan Heights. And that brings us to this particular time. Because this week, the president uh, acknowledged that the Golan Heights, which had been declared uh, by more than a decade ago to be part of Israel, by the Israelis themselves, okay? That, that they, the President Trump recognized uh, Israeli sovereignty in the Golan Heights. Now, I realize, okay, I realize that there might not be people in this room that particularly like our president, okay? And they think that he does a lot of bad things, and maybe he does. I'm not gonna get into the pre president. You know, I, I can tell you this, I don't like the way he talks about John McCain. But that's not the point here, okay? The point is, whether or not this president, like him or not, did the right thing as far as I'm concerned, that's what I'm gonna share with you, and as far as the people of Israel were concerned, the people who live in the state of Israel. So first of all, you need to understand that there is a law, an international law, that was made after World War II that said the following, that people could not annex territory taken in war. And yet, what people <laughs> don't understand, and you'll find this in the, in the media uh, this week, is that only applies to a war that is a defensive war, meaning that if one country attacks another, which is what Syria did on June 9th, 1967, by shelling the Israelis below, 
that there is no guarantee in international law that in a war of defense, I'm trying to explain this as clearly as I can, that after a war of defense where land was conquered, that Israel has to, by international law, return the land that it conquered as part of a defensive war. And that makes sense because if you could say that, if a country knew that if they attack another country and they lose the war, they're going to get the land back anyway, what would that cost? It would just cause more people or more countries to attack. Now, after the Six-Day War, there was a resolution from the United Nations called Resolution 242, which said that Israel would withdraw from, the, from territories, from territories occupied in the Six-Day Day War. That would apply to the Golan Heights, but it doesn't say all of the territories. It says some territories, it doesn't say some, it says territories, and that was the Israeli understanding. And sure enough, in 1974, as a result of Henry Kissinger's what we call shuttle diplomacy, Israel did withdraw from some of the Golan Heights, particularly from the town of, K of Kunetra. And that, and in so doing, it was living in fulfillment of at least part of Resolution 242. But let's shift for just a second. Let's talk about those 19 years, those 19 years from 48 to 67, that this area was controlled by the Syrians. There are 80,000 Druze people up there. Druze are not Muslims, they're cousins of Muslims. Okay, there were 80,000 Druze up there and lots of Syrian army personnel. The Syrians made a, uh, the Syrians made, put into the ground mines all over the place, land mines and anti-personnel mines, anti-tank mines. And one of the things they did, which was against the Geneva Convention, is that they did not, uh, they did not map where those land mines are found, were found. So therefore, after the war, okay, after the Six Day War when Israel took over the Golan Heights, there's a problem of landmines all over the place. And we don't know exactly where, where they are. So if you go up to the Golan Heights today, you can see barbed wire with uh, red triangles on, on it saying, don't go there because landmines are there. And of course, the problem is, is that some of the times that the cows go into minefields, the cows of Bashan, and then you have steak. Okay? <laughs> Poor cows. It's really not nice to say that about a, a living creature. But this is the problem of their death. In, in all those 19 years, nothing was planted in the ground of the Golan Heights except for landmines. Since that time, Israel's cleaned out as much of the land, landmines as they can, as is feasible as possible, and has created up, up there, near Kunetra, some of the Moshevim that are up there, it's created a magnificent wine industry because the climate there and the uh, basalt uh, in, the, in, the, um, in the soil is perfect for growing wine. And the best Israeli wine now is made in the Golan Heights. And that's what's up there. <laughs> but let's go back to the fact that for Israel, the Golan Heights is a strategic necessity. Uh, Colonel Sidon Cheto, who was an expert on 73 wars, uh, said, if Israel is in full possession of the Golan Heights, the chances of Syria launching a war are infinitely lower than if the Golan was re returned to Syri Syria. And if it were returned, Syria would then en enjoy a crushing topological strategic tactical and intelligence uh, superiority. So here, April 9th is elections in Israel. If you go and talk to the Israelis, whether they're left or right, center, it doesn't matter. Most of the Israelis, the Jewish Israelis, will say, 80 plus percent, that under no circumstances can Israel return to a situation where the Golan Heights are in the hands of the Syrians, okay? That it would be a disaster, an absolute disaster, were that red part up there to be returned to Syria. And let me tell you why it would be a disaster, particularly now. What was it, less than two months ago, we were up on the Golan Heights. 
We were looking into Syria. It was an amazing moment. We were with, had a briefing by a lieutenant colonel in the IDF. And we were standing on top of a, of a building. And 400 meters away from us was the border. There was uh, fences and nothing was getting listening. And, uh, equipment, uh, motion detectors, nothing was getting through that fence. And we, we were standing up there, Rabbi Korn and I, with some uh, local ministers uh, from Greece, where we were standing up there, and this lieutenant colonel said to us in the following, he says, over there towards Lebanon is Hezbollah. And over there, coming this way, there is remnants of Al-Qaeda. And then if you come a little bit more, there's remnants of ISIS. ISIS is still there. And if you come here, towards the center, five miles from us, there are elements of the Syrian army. There are elements of the Syri Syrian army. And then he says, and over there, back in that area, are the Iranians. And behind them are the Russians. So we asked him, why does the Russians want to, what do they want in Syria? And the answer was that they got two naval bases on the Mediterranean and an Air Force base up in the northern part of, of, uh, of uh, Syria. But then we came back to the Syrian army. Because if you know what's going on in Syria in the past years, you would know the fact that there has been a horrible civil war caused by the brutality of the current ruler of Syria, Assad. And in that civil war, 600,000 people have died. 600,000 people have died. Set close to 7 million have become refugees in Europe and other places in the Middle East. And it's now estimated that in that war, in that war, the Syrians gas, used uh, gas on their people, on their own people, more than 300 times. So if you're an Israeli, it's bad enough to think that Hamas could be firing uh, or weapons, supposedly accidentally at my kids from Gaza. But if you're an Israeli and you see what's going on in Syria, you come to the conclusion that in no way, shape, form could Israel ever give up the strategic advantage of the Golan Heights. We cannot be that naive. There is great danger in Syria and strategic depth the strategic depth provided by the Golan Heights is very, very important for keeping what I consider to be my brothers and sisters uh, safe in Israel. So it's because of that that when President Trump announces this week that he acknowledges or recognizes Israel's uh, sovereignty on the Golan Heights, that the people of Israel, okay, the people who live in Israel, were very happy about it. Uh, it's also for that reason, because I understand having been a soldier up there, having been a soldier up there, when you were a soldier there too, you want to say? Just in a sentence or two. Okay, go oh, ahead. Oh, Rabbi. I was a soldier up there too. Though. Well, oh, Rabbi, the leader of our congregation, but in his head and heart, is dead. Having served with the reconnaissance of the Golani Brigade, it's so special to hear our rabbi share the importance of this event for our peaceful coexistence. Thank you, Rabbi. You shot for us. Thank you. <laughs> and by the way, Zeb knows what it means to be threatened. He's a survivor of Auschwitz, as well as a member of the Israel Defense Forces and the War of Independence. So in other words, this is, I really appreciate that. You caught me by surprise. I'm a little bit embarrassed, but I was, <laughs> okay. But here's what it is. Here's what it is. When we look at this, okay. I love the cows. <laughs> when we look at this, we say, thank God. Thank God that standing between that insanity and the insane rulers who are gassing their own people, driving them out of the country, right? 
between that and the center of Israel, there's something called the Golan Heights. And up on the Golan Heights, there's something called the Israel Defense Forces, which is keeping the people of Israel tonight as we speak safe. All right? This has nothing to do with Palestinians. It has nothing to do with a two-state solution. It has to do with the fact that whether we like it or not, there is great evil right now in Syria. Because I don't know how else you could call. There's a picture, by the way, of 50 children that happened what was about a year ago. 50 children whose bodies are just laid out because they were gassed by their own government. So there's great evil on that, on that side. And I, again, whether you like the president or not, it's not the issue. For me, this was a very good thing. And that's what I wanted to share with you tonight. But despite all of that evil, and despite all of the difficulty that's involved, I really do feel that we have to end up with a prayer for peace. We have to end up tonight, we can't just say, this is all terrible, which it isn't, thank God. It could be much worse. But we need to take out our prayer books, and we need to do a prayer for the state of Israel and for peace. Uh, what page is it on? It's on uh, what, 374? 377. Turn to page 377. Avinu Sheba Shemayim. Sur Yisrael Magola, O Heavenly One, Protector and Redeemer of Israel, bless the state of Israel, which marks the dawning of hope for all who seek peace. Let's read it together, the rest. Shield it beneath the wings of your love, spread over the canopy of peace. Send your light and truth to all who lead and advise, guiding them with your good counsel. Establish peace in the land and fullness of joy for all who dwell there. Together we say, Amen. 